Hello and welcome back to Omics Logic Transcriptomics. In this session, we will speak about exploratory and comparative analysis, important steps that need to be understood and used properly by anyone who would like to perform meaningful analysis of transcriptomic data and be able to interpret their results in biological terms. In this session, we'll review the limitations of data visualization and see how we can explore large data sets including methods to identify global patterns and interpret them. We will look at how to define specific contrasts based on our exploratory analysis, and then how to turn to a comparison using hypothesis testing to find specific genes that answer a criteria that we set. So at the end of today's session, you will understand these concepts in detail and have the ability to practice and apply them using a variety of tools, such as the TBioInfo platform, Excel, R and Python. Let's start by reviewing again some of the ways data can be visualized and what limitations we face when a large number of observations have to be studied together as a whole. This will also serve as an introduction to data mining, an important topic that combines multiple methods that allow us to understand a structure of a data set and find specific methods to interrogate the structure and find differences that we are interested in. Remember that we are working with a table of expression where columns are samples, rows are genes, and the numbers in each cell can be raw or normalized counts of reads mapped to a specific region on the reference genome. In the previous session, we discussed how such data can be explored visually, looking at individual gene expression patterns across samples, like a bar plot, or by summarizing gene expression for a single sample but all the genes using global properties like the mean, median, maximum, minimum, or distribution, and how we can compare these global attributes between samples. We also discussed the significance of normal distribution, which is not typical for gene expression data, but very important for comparing samples. So as a result, we looked at filtering, normalization, and scaling, which are all typically applied first to fit the data to the assumptions of some statistical analysis methods that we rely on. These methods are important for statistical analysis, but also for visual comparison. For example, after log scaling, filtering low values, and normalization, we can visually clearly validate important assumptions about the data. So here you can see a distribution in a histogram for two samples, and then those two samples plotted against each other using a scatter plot. Now we can compare these samples and find genes that are highly correlated and those that are not. We see that the bulk of our data is correlated, and so our assumption about these samples belonging to the same group are correct. These visuals are especially important when we do not have control over experimental design and use data that was generated by someone else, either from a single lab or multiple labs. So a quick way to compare multiple samples and understand global patterns across the full data set is to visualize the data using box plots, where each box represents a sample. And if we color them by group, we can now see global comparison between these groups. But these rough data summaries can be very misleading. As we can see when we compare the information in box plots and histograms, box plots are useful to spot the strongest signal present in each sample but they also reduce a lot of data to a minimum information. But complex visualization like the violin plots make it much more difficult to compare global patterns in our data between samples and across many samples or groups of samples. So how can we capture all of this variability in detail and at the same time explore relationships between samples or groups of samples? To answer this question, let's explore what information is contained in each one of our genes and find what kinds of associations we can start looking for using multiple features or multiple genes in a data set. So here we can see one gene, a feature of a data set or a gene expression pattern. This visual helps us spot some patterns of similarity. For example, some samples are highly expressed. Other samples have a low expression. We can compare them by taking the mean and calculating fold change, dividing one mean by the other, 
and we get a result of about 3, or 3.28. In some cases, this is not enough information, and we would like to find additional sources of information to differentiate between these samples further. So now we can add a second gene. Instead of using a bar plot, we'll use a scatter plot. Gene 1 is the x-axis, and gene 2 is the y-axis. The previous samples that we looked at are similar according to gene 1, or on the x-axis, but they're far away according to gene 2, or the y-axis. Instead, we can start seeing more complex patterns. For example, sample 3, 6, and 7 are close together on both x and y-axis. But other samples also have some similar and interesting patterns. So when we take all of our samples but two genes, the amount of information increases and the patterns become more complex. In this multidimensional plot, the patterns are becoming more complex, but we can use a visual representation that is turned in a specific way to find interesting similarities between our samples and even find a way to separate them according to a single line. We now understand the need for dimensionality reduction. When we have all of our genes, we cannot visualize it, but we understand the significance of this information as a whole. So how can we combine all of these different methods and try to get a meaningful visual for a space that we definitely cannot understand? To understand what principal component analysis does, let's take a look at this projection. So let's imagine we have this cloud of dots. And the cloud of dots can have a low variance if we just look at our axes x and y, or it can have a high variance. To maximize the variance, we need to find a projection in this space that is not either one of the axes or the features that we have, and turn this sample set in such a way that the axes maximize variance. So if we're using this approach of principal components, we're looking for a plane in the multidimensional space that we cannot see that explains variance in our data in the best possible way. Now we can compare samples or dots on the scatter plot or sample groups using the principal components that accurately represent all of the features in our data. Let's see how other biologists use this technique by looking at several publications. The first publication is titled Transcriptomic Analysis of Calcium Remodeling in Colorectal Cancer. In the section about principal component analysis, the authors write, we found that PC1 clearly explains the difference between phenotypes, since the projections of the values for each sample over PC1 show how the samples belong to a healthy phenotype and are well separated from the samples belonging to the tumor phenotype. Given that PC1 clearly reproduces the two different groups related with the phenotype, it is interesting to evaluate the influence of each original variable gene, which is proportional to a coefficient associated with the linear combination for each gene. So we see that the authors apply principal component analysis to the data, they evaluate how accurately the PCA represents the original data, and now they can evaluate the phenotype information that they have about differences between normal and cancer samples. The principal components allow them to start looking into genes that are correlated with the principal components, or simply use the separation between groups of data to start comparing individual genes between those groups of samples. The second article is titled Transcriptomic Analysis Identifies Gene Networks Regulated by Estrogen Receptor A and B That Control Distinct Effects of Different Botanical Estrogens, where the authors compared estrogens produced by plants in terms of the effects they might have on gene expression patterns in breast cancer cell lines. This is the portion describing their use of PCA. These comparisons among the four estrogens were examined further by principal component analysis, PCA, which enables one to visually assess global similarities and differences between sample groups. Expression patterns for all compounds were different from those in vehicle control treated cells. So the authors here used PCA to explore the data and assess similarities and differences between four groups of samples to understand what kinds of differences emerged from all of the gene expression patterns. Later, they used the insights from PCA to quantify effects of different compounds on gene expression networks.
So let's now see how to perform such analysis. First, we will take the gene expression table and filter out genes with zero values across all samples and even genes that have a very low level of expression. Next, we will head on to the tBioInfo platform and select the utilities section. Once inside, upload the gene expression table in tab delimited txt file. The pipeline we can build will include quantile normalization, where we will transform data to log normal scale and select a threshold of 5, as well as PCA, where we can also filter the data using various thresholds. As a result of principal component analysis, we will get a table of values for each principal component associated with each object or a sample in our dataset. Columns will also contain a percentage of variance that each component explains. We can visualize our data by assigning coordinates for each sample based on the principal components that best explain the variance of our data. Now we are visualizing the samples on a scatter plot using principal component analysis results. Notice that we can see a distinction between samples of the triple negative and estrogen receptor positive samples by their position on the x axis. We also see that there's an outlier sample in the triple negative group based on the y coordinate. Another way to run PCA and annotate the results is to use R. To do that, first we need to add sample labels in a row called group. Then we can again use the area of the tBioInfo platform called data mining and find the unsupervised analysis section. The section implements PCA in R with ggplot outputs. In the PCA parameters, you can select options for data scaling and centering. The output is a PDF file that shows samples colored by group name. You will also get an output that contains the actual R script. And later on in this video, I will show you where you can practice some of the scripting related to performing the full PCA analysis in R. One way to practice these methods is to explore projects on the Learn portal. Each project contains a dataset that comes from a publication that you can read to understand what the authors were trying to do. In this case, the project is called Modeling Precision Medicine. The objective of this project is to find subtypes of cancer and link them to effective treatment. In the portion that we discuss, we use the gene expression data from 50 cell lines to find subtypes of breast cancer and genes that can be used to identify these samples and the differences between subtypes. Another project example is an analysis of the Cancer Genome Project gene expression data called TCGA, liver cancer risk. One of the examples we use here is a comparison between samples with liver and breast cancer to see how global gene expression patterns separate samples. As a result, PCA clearly shows that the major separation between samples happens along the x-axis, which is associated with tissue type, or the difference between liver and breast. The y-axis, which doesn't have as much variability, shows the difference between cancer and normal samples. So our conclusion is that tissue type has a much greater influence on gene expression patterns overall than the difference between tumor and normal samples. So what can we say about PCA for such exploratory analysis? It can be useful to explore patterns in data, understand major trends, find features that contribute to such variability, understand noisiness of data, and find outliers that need further investigation. We can liken PCA to a photographer trying to find the best angle for a picture that will capture as much detail as possible, while showing us the most information about the group as a whole. We would typically use this method to visualize and explore data. When using this multivariate analysis method, it is important to play around with the data using normalization and filtering while paying attention to outliers for the best possible interpretation. To further explore these methods and practice how to use them, just load all of the courses on the Learn portal. Lesson seven in the transcriptomics course will introduce you to PCA and provide additional details that we did not cover in this session. It also offers several quiz questions that can help you evaluate your own understanding of this method. For example, which of the following is based on this PCA plot? Which of the following would be useful comparisons in differential gene expression studies? What might be one of the interpretation of PCA results of gene expression tables? 
Moreover, lessons in this course will offer coding exercises for PCA in R using ggplot2. Here you can practice using several different datasets to explore global patterns. Similar code can be also implemented in Python with an additional resource, a notebook that you can keep all of the code and solve a challenge that we offer. To summarize, PCA is a part of exploratory data analysis. In a classical setting, we have control over the experiment design, so we can use it to identify trends in data that fit the design of the experiment. When we work with data that we didn't generate and we want to understand pattern, we also can find new insights about data sets without any previous understanding of the samples. In the classical example, we first develop a model to set thresholds that we're looking for, and then we perform data analysis to see whether the data can explain the model. When we talk about exploratory data analysis, we first perform data analysis to design a model. That model can lead us to select thresholds for comparative analysis.